The NBA playoffs are right around the corner. Welcome back to the NBA Breakdown, the playoffs preview podcast. There's actually still a lot to be settled before we get to the playoffs. It doesn't mean that it's too early, though, to make some bold predictions about what's going to happen, though. I've got uh, NBA analyst from the Athletics, Seth Part now, and also the Athletics NBA insider, Joe Varden, alongside me, as ever, uh, for another edition of the podcast. And, I mean, nobody expected the Chicago Bulls or the Dallas Mavericks or the Memphis Grizzlies or especially the Cleveland Cavaliers to be this good, uh, gentlemen. Um, we'd say nobody expected the New York Knicks to be this bad, but we always kind of believe that the Knicks um, will be this bad at all times, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, gents, uh, we'll start off with yourself, Joe. I mean, it's been a really interesting season, as it always is. Um, but who's kind of impressed and surprised in the second half of the season? I'm thinking since the last time we recorded a podcast. Well, suppressed and, and surprised, uh, or impressed and surprised, excuse me, um, I think I would start with with Phoenix uh, to have survived uh, the Chris Paul injury with with no problem whatsoever. Uh, Memphis, clearly the second best team in the NBA. Um, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about the Miami Heat, which you say, what's surprising about them? I mean, they've been up near the top all year, but within about a two and a half, three week span here, um, they essentially imploded with a roof on fire incident. Uh, Eric Spolstra, the coach, nearly getting into a fight on the bench with the team's best player, Jimmy Butler. Um, They they lost four in a row. All of a sudden, it looked like they were headed for a four seed. And then, uh, as of this recording, they go out and have probably the most adult road trip that anybody's had all season. Um, They go to Boston, who was the hottest team in the league, and they beat Boston. Great win. They go up to Chicago and just dismantle the Bulls on a Saturday night. And then Sunday on a back-to-back, cross the border, go to Toronto. Really tough place to play. um, And they win there. So now it looks like the Heat are first in the East. They've survived this catastrophe. Um, So that's where I start, those three. Okay. Okay. I suppose I'm going to ask you exactly the same question, Seth. Here. Sure. Um, first of all, on, on the heat, I mean, I thought that there was a lot of, a lot made of that and, 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 you know, these things happen. Um, it's, it's unusual. They happen on the bench, but uh, you know, flare ups between coaches and stars are, are sort of over an 82 game season happen a lot. And um, so I did think that the reaction to that was a little, like, well, they're still in like second place here, calm down. And, and that's sort of what happened, I think, for, but to switch to things that, that are impressive, and this is going to sound weird uh, because he certainly got plenty of publicity, but I think that we are still a little, or maybe even a lot slow to recognize Nikola Jokic. Okay. Um, I, I think he is, I mean, the fact that, that he has Denver with the squad they've had available all year in contention for a home court playoff place, largely on the back of his just absurdity. And he's going to win his second straight MVP. He should, at least at this point, I don't, I like, I I think that there are, you know, people are making arguments that are probably more narrative than merit driven for other players. Um, Certainly Giannis is, is making a late push, but over the bulk of the season, just an, like two absolutely absurd seasons back to back. Um, and the only, the only real drawback is that he had, since he hasn't had the squad behind him to make a deep playoff run, but the fact that they even made the second round last year. So, and I know that's not all this year, but the fact that, Oh, well, you know, Jokic will regress a little from last year was what we thought going into this year. And instead he's been even better. He's gone to just another level. And um, partially it's because Denver and their games aren't on TV locally and they're on, they're not on the East coast, but this isn't, this is someone who he does this one or two more times. This is an all-time great player we're talking about here. Um, wow. and I don't say that lightly. And I, so I think that's big picture. Maybe the thing we're missing most or where that's surprised me most about this season. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a quite a big takeaway to, to get away from it. Just for, for our listeners, who are obviously thinking of having a look. I mean, definitely go to the website, pinnacle.com, have a look at all the basketball odds. The Denver Nuggets, just so 
You at home listening are aware there, as we record this, 26.080 to win the overall NBA title and Miami Heat 12.5. I'll pick out some more of those odds as we go through. What's the general mood around the league, though? I mean, I, 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 that's a really general kind of question, but what what do people view this season as having been like? I'll start with you, Seth, on, on this one, because I, I suppose you can answer this in whatever way that you want, but what 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 are people talking about the NBA? What are, what are the sort of little, little bits that perhaps those who don't follow it as closely are looking at? Um, I think the the one one thing is just the anticipation for the East Conference, the Eastern playoffs, especially. Um you know, there are there are a lot of very good teams. And then you have the the oddness of of you know a team that's worked all, hard all year to get a first or second seed. And as a reward, they get the whatever version of the Brooklyn Nets show up. Um, but whatever version of the Brooklyn Nets show up, it's you know, a guy who's on the very short list of most dangerous playoff players in the league and Gavin Durant. So that's that's uh, some reward for having you know toiled away over over the full season. But the, just I think that's really there's a sense of anticipation I think just for how um, in prospect how many of these matchups are just so tasty. Jay. Well, I, I mean, Seth mentioned Brooklyn, and you know, I always it's it's funny. I think every time that we sit down to talk, we always reference something from the very our very first podcast of the season. And if you think back to that day, we talked about the odds to win it all. And, and the top two teams were Brooklyn and the Lakers. And, you know, the Lakers are almost for sure not going to be in the playoffs now. Um, they're not even going to make the play in. We're talking just an unforeseen epic collapse that has totally clouded, uh, I think, discussion uh, throughout the league all season. Um involving you know arguably the greatest player of all time and what he does next and how they fix this and do they have to trade Anthony Davis and do they have to fire everybody um so I think that has kind of clouded the mood and and you think about not just Brooklyn being in this precarious situation where they're going to be in the play-in but do they make it out and then they get into a first round they become maybe one of the most dangerous low seeds ever um, mm -hmm. you know, but it's the way they got there, right? It is the animosity that, that Kyrie Irving sort of brought on himself and the trade that they had to make. Um, and then are, is it even going to pan out? Like we thought, like, are, are we ever going to see Ben Simmons? Then even if we don't, are the Nets a better team anyway, because of the two ancillary players that they got there in Seth Curry and, and Andre Drummond. So I think that's one part of the mood. Seth hit it right on the head. Everybody's fired up about the East in general. That's the second thing. And then I think, you know, we just, we have a number of places, whether it's Golden State, Cleveland, um, Brooklyn is one. Uh, is somebody you guys could throw it if I'm thinking of anybody else, but just these, oh, Denver, of course. Yeah, Denver's the other real big one where we just have these teams heading into the postseason with their best or second best players out. And they haven't played either all year or been out a month. And, and the thing is, we don't know if or when they're coming back. Um, and I think that is kind of clouding everybody's uh, just sort of uh, judgment or, or, you know, darkening the picture here as, as to how this is going to play out. Like who, who's going to come back and when and, and how that impacts this race. Just to point out, actually, when we are recording this podcast, it is the day after, effectively, the lake is suffered that bit of a bit of a dent really i mean it basically makes it all all but certain that they aren't going to be involved in those planes they lost to the denver nuggets and you know they're 11th in that western conference so they're going to be missing out because it's only teams from 7th to 10th in both east and west who get through to those planes and obviously then two from each division then getting a place in those end of season playoffs and the lakers mm -mm, not happening for them this year we don't think at time of recording anyway. It's quite important to point that out. We've got, but barring something really, really bizarre happening. I want to talk about individuals. You mentioned a few individuals there, Joe. So, I mean, you've got players like Devin Booker, Luca, uh, Jay Moran as well, uh, trying to kind of push the NBA into the future in many ways, right? And then you've had people like um, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, who are trying to make one last run at a title. 
So what what's going to happen? You know, what is going to happen here? Because it feels like it's a bit of a changing of the guard in in many respects. And, you know, there'll be a lot of people who know the names that I've just mentioned, but they won't necessarily mm. know what that means in terms of the NBA ebbing and flowing. Well, gee, uh, you know, Kevin Durant just won Team USA a gold medal. And, and you know, I, I think that he deserves a lot of the credit for winning. Um, so that shows, I think it's another example of him, even at this advanced age, being able to carry a team and do it very, you know, really take them on a journey. Assuming he and Kyrie are healthy, I mean, you know, they're going to give Miami all they can handle if, if indeed that's one versus eight. Um, I think that if Steph is hurt, is Steph Curry is healthy and, and the Warriors are as healthy as they can be, um, they were you know, right there with the Suns through Christmas. So, you know, I'd say the Warriors had a better chance to get back to the finals and win it than, than Brooklyn does at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are, we are entering, I think that next stage, I, I think, you know, LeBron's really getting up there. He's going to be 38 next season. Um, Durant is having trouble staying healthy. In the meantime, you have a Devin Booker who it looks like the Suns are going to be really good for a long time. Um, Giannis is, is, makes the, the Bucks a factor Joker in, in Denver. I mean, you know, we don't think they're going to do much this season, but next year, assuming everybody's healthy, they, they are an absolutely a contender John Morant. And then I would also throw out, um, Desmond Bain and, and Jaron Jackson Jr. In Memphis. I mean, huge, absurd strides. And what are they set? They're like 18 and two without John. It just shows like how good and deep they are. Um, so it's, you know, I think we're there. I think, I think we are there where we are starting to see the baton pass to this uh, next generation and, and it, the, the league's in good hands. Could see Seth nodding when I said the changing of the guard. Is that the way that you see it this season? It feels like that a watershed season in many ways. I mean, it's sort of, um, the 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 uh sort of the mark twain uh quote the reports of my demise are greatly exaggerated i sort we've sort of been looking at lebron sort of that way for a number of years i first wrote about maybe lebron starting to starting to feel the effects of age i first wrote that article six years ago i think and <laughs> so i've kind of i've been burned by that so i've held off on on like that sort of mm. thought process Ever since. Um, but I mean, I think that for any number of reasons, I think we can kind of say, well, he's still a great player. He's probably for the first time in 15 years, he's not in the discussion for being the best player in the league. So, yes, I do think that that among like for other among other reasons that, yeah, we're talking about, you know, it's not it's now it's it's Giannis's league it's it's uh, uh, Joker's league it's it's Joel Embiid's league it's Jason Tatum's league um so that's that has been really sort of uh you know in the historical sense I think that's that's sort of where we are in the arc of NBA history can I ask a question go for it can I, can I ask it? all right because uh obviously Seth and I agree on this however I think if you asked people who the best the best player in the NBA today is, I think it's an old head. Um, I think most people would say Durant is the best player. So I'm going to ask you, Seth, do you think Durant is the best player right now? So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did, I, you know, every year I do my, my, my player tiers. I don't love ranking players because I feel like you get close enough amongst guys that, you know, it's, it's as much situation as anything else, but in the top group of who is in that discussion for best player, I have three people and it's, it's Durant, uh, Giannis and, and Jokic. Now, if you forced me to pick one with the goal of you're dropping this guy on a team and make it a championship team, I think that's Durant still. Um, just because he's the, like the versatility of the number of different roles and context you can put him in and he'll still just be an all-time great score. And it's just a little tougher with, you know, Jokic is, is sort of unprecedented as an offensive engine, as a center. Um, and, and Giannis is obviously a, has, 
there's some specific specificity in the players you need to put next to them. So just by the narrowest of margins, I guess if you forced me to pick one, I would still say Durant, but I wouldn't argue with anyone too hard if they said it was either of the other two players. This is all very interesting. There we go. I mean, what's, what's, are, you, are you a Durant man on that front, Joe, or are you not going to know your colors to the mast? No, I, I, I am, but my <laughs> caveat is more that um, – you are only valuable to your team when you are available. And if you look at Joker and you look at Giannis, they are clearly more durable at this stage of their careers um, than, than Durant is. And, and this guy, this guy is brilliant when he's out there, but has had year after year after year of significant injury. Um, and so when I think about what the Nets are capable of this spring, I, 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 I don't know how high I can set the bar. Cause I'm just, I'm not sure he's going to make it for, for one. I think that's um, at the start of the year, we, we had sort of thought that they could, because they had the three guys, they could sort of manage the, the, the load and the minutes and the, and the nights off between the three of them. So they weren't like demanding too much of any one player. And I think that the Irving situation, in addition to sort of the him not being on the court and the discord it caused with James Harden by sort of all reports. I think that that's a further knock on effect is that instead of Durant being able to sort of be managed through the regular season, he's had to go full tilt, big minutes every night. And, you know, whether it's a random freak injury of a guy falling into his leg or kind of a more of a a repetitive stress injury that does put you at greater risk. So I think that that's, um, you know, when you really dig in deep to sort of the the things that can swing a season, I feel like that might be an under discussed factor. Also, I mean, we've got to talk about Ben Simmons as well. We're going to sort of (laughs) I've just seen some reports, you know, it's not not realistic that we're going to see him return at all uh, certainly in the in the reg, in the regular season the the nets are actually uh, for for our listeners they're at 7.480 which puts them kind of in like the second or third favorite column with pinnacle as a betting company but how much is that impacting on 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 things that whole situation because that's that can't be nice having that in the background can it I don't think that one is as big of a factor in Brooklyn as sort of the tumultuous relationship between James and the rest of the organization was when, when Harden was there. I mean, it's easy to get along uh, and, and move forward as a team without a guy that you never had to begin with. And so Ben Simmons has never played for them. Um, and then in the meantime, they picked up a shooter in Seth Curry, which they didn't have in Joe Harris. He's the year has been almost entirely lost by his ankle trouble. Um, and then they've been, they don't really have any bigs. And so Andre Drummond, I mean, he's got his, his issues. Yes, but he's been really good for them off the bench. And, um, and so I think they got a little better in that trade, regardless of whether Ben Simmons plays. I just don't know what you can expect of him if he does come back. I mean, we saw what happened to him um, emotionally, mentally, whatever you want to say in his last playoff run. And that is after a year of playing and being in top physical condition and, and, and everything that it takes to be playoff ready. You're going to ask him to play for the first time all year since that, since that incident, since everything went down the way it did. And then to be, a full year behind everybody else in terms of intensity and repetition. I just don't know how that works. I really don't. Yeah. Seth is that. And, and he's not exactly a plug and play player. Like I do think, I do think that, that, you know, they do have some flexibility in how they play because, you know, a team that's built around Kyrie and KD is going to be somewhat unstructured just, you know, by having two guys that improvisational, um, so that on one hand makes him probably easier than it would be in a more regimented system, but at the same time, I, it's, it's hard to disagree with anything, anything Joe just said there. Um, you know, I, when they made the trade, I thought that like he would make them a, a pretty, a possibly scary, uh, proposition in the playoffs because, um, with him and Durant at the forward spots, uh, suddenly they become a better defense, um, 
And that's that that's for this year. That's clearly not going to happen. I don't think even if he, even if he plays somehow, um, but certainly going forward um, there, they, they, their future is probably brighter post trade than it was before making that move. Okay. There we go. There we go. Nods of approval from, from Joe as well for, for, for that. Um, we'll move on slightly. Um, we'll look ahead to, you know, the, the, overall NBA title winner. And there's something that we kind of all pre-recording or picked up on, on this a little bit. And it was the, basically that every NBA champion since the year 2000 has ranked 11th or better in defensive efficiency. Now there's lots of theories floating around. You've written an article on this set, I believe who has been the best defensive lineups this season um, in, in both of your opinion. And then there's also kind of an add on to that. And it's like, okay, well, that's all good and well. X, Y, or Z have been the best defensively. But, uh, you know, is that a good yardstick? Is that something that you'd kind of look at when you were, when you're trying to work out who's going who's gonna to win the overall, overall title? Well, the best defense all season is kind of... Uh, you know, the, the team that I've been sort of coalescing behind up until about a week ago was Boston. And then obviously Robert Williams goes down and, and that is a huge ch- So they've been like, especially once they've sort of got their team together, they've been by a decent margin, the best defense in the league. Um, in terms of the teams that are good enough defensively, um, I think, I mean, you, you, you talk about Miami, you talk about uh, Milwaukee. Now we haven't seen it all year, but again, they've been missing Brooke Lopez all year and that's been a huge, um, but I think when we're, when we're talking about the championship, um, there's no other place like this, this discussion should start with, tell me why the Suns aren't going to win the title this year. Um, that's the first the place you have to go with the argument. I think that they've sort of been, because even with the Chris Paul injury they've been so kind of drama free the last two they've just been sort of metronomically winning games and winning games that we just haven't really they haven't gone on a run they've just been excellent continuously um and and they're they're deep they have shot making they have interior presence they have five big wings which are you could never have enough of them in the playoffs like why why should we expect it to be anybody but the phoenix suns Okay. Well, in which case then, Joe Varden, tell me why it's not going to be the Phoenix Suns. Well, I think, I think it probably will be. Um, but Chris Paul's durability is an issue and you get into a conference final or final situation. We've seen and play through things that affect his game. It happened last year. Um, so I think that would be one factor. The second thing I think for as, as deep on the wing as the, um, as the Suns are, they still, I, I mean, I, I don't know that they have an answer for Giannis and Giannis changed that series last year. He could probably do it again. Although Milwaukee losing PJ Tucker sort of allows Phoenix's depth at that wing position to, to take more of a, of a, of a center stage. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I the, the thing when you talk about how you grade uh, or how you look forward to pl- the playoffs and I don't like taking almost anything that happens in, in the regular season, because as we know, Playoff series are, are seven games, up to seven games. You have to beat somebody four times to advance. So anything that happens on a Tuesday in February or March, um, almost like you have to discount it, I think, when you're really trying to figure out how, how it goes uh, in a playoff series. I don't know who's going to beat uh, the Suns four times. I, I don't think it's anybody outside of Golden State in the West. Um, and then in the East... Because Milwaukee did it once, okay, um, it would seem like it would seem like the Heat would have trouble because the the, the Suns are big and, and the Heat really have struggle with size. So, you know, I, I think it's it's hard. I mean, Boston is a team because of the way 
that the Celtics defend if healthy, you know, they get, they can make it that far without Robert Williams. So it's just, yeah, the, like for as wide open as the playoff race overall seems, I think when you really boil it down, there's only a couple teams you could even mention uh, is uh, imagining them beating the Suns in a seven game series. Okay. Seth, I feel like, on. I feel like Joe just asked if Phoenix can do it on a cold, rainy Tuesday in snow. That's a different, that's a, that's a different sport. So never mind. I, I was thinking that exact same thing. I thought, is that, is that really, is that the NBA version of that? That's, that's awesome. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, for, for our listeners to, to win, uh, to win the uh, Western conference, Phoenix Suns are at 2.1, which is like incredibly short odds. Golden state warriors, the closest to them at five, 5.3 so everything that you two are saying is completely in keeping with basically how the bookmaker and in particular pinnacle and all the odds are available at pinnacle.com see it as well um so yeah and the phoenix suns to win the overall title are at 3.96 and well the nearest to that is indeed the milwaukee bucks so that's probably in keeping uh, with everything uh, that we've been saying as well um underdogs then right so we're kind of talking who's going to beat the Suns, who on earth is going to beat the Suns, who can beat them four times. Somebody's got to beat them four times if you're going to stop them from doing it. But um, underdogs, outsiders, play, you know, teams that might have players to come back who've suffered a bit of an injury, who've been petering along, who analysts are seeing good signs from, but not quite bringing it onto the court. Who's going to flourish like a spring flower? Um, coming into the, this very important part of the season, Seth. Um, I think when you talk about coming back from injury, um, first of all, um, we haven't really heard much at all about Kawhi Leonard. I just want to throw that out there. Go um, for it. <laughs> that's, but I don't think that. I mean, I think like given everything about the way he's treated, you know, injury in the past, probably not. Okay. Um, but Denver, they get, they start to get, you know, Jamal Murray back, uh, start to get, uh, uh, Michael Porter Jr. Back. And then with the way Jokic is playing, I, it's not a really a team I would want a much of a piece of come, come the business end. Okay. Um, and then the other, the other team that you just have to look at how they've played for much of the second half of the year, uh, especially post trade deadline is Dallas. Um, I haven't necessarily been a big, big believer in the Mavericks all year, but it seems like as he's gotten in better shape over the year, Luca has kind of reached another level. And then adding Spencer Dinwiddie has given them another big ball handler who can make a play. That's been something that they've really lacked in previous postseasons. Okay. Joe, have you got anything that's different to that? So... <clears throat> My my answer was going to be no one, uh, no one who's middling now will show in will will show when it matters. I I was going to say I feel like we know what we know about these teams and we know who they are. Um, Denver would be the one uh, that would be the tough out, but then that is assuming that Jamal Murray goes from having not played at all in a full year to to being playoff Jamal Murray scoring 30 to 50 points a game being bubble Jamal I mean I, I just don't I don't know that that's possible I mean maybe it is for him but it, but I mean the Nuggets are certainly being careful there um I've seen the Sixers play a bunch lately and I love their starting five um and I don't like their bench at all and so you know, I, I don't I don't see them as being a team that that surprises us. Um, you know, may, you know, they get out of the first round. Maybe uh, we'll see if they end up in Toronto and if COVID stuff gets trips them up I, or uh, vaccine stuff trips them up. We'll see um, the, the team that, that Seth mentioned that would in my book would count is the Celtics because I have slept on them all year. I've just refused to pay any attention um, I, I, it, as soon as they were like, I mean, they were like a 500 team. I think they were 11 in 11th place, maybe at the trade deadline, something insane like that. Um, and I, I was not paying attention to their defensive revival 
And then I started watching about a week before Robert Williams got hurt and had started to believe. And then now, you know, that's going to throw them back. I mean, way back uh, as far as just the, the growth that they've made. So if he comes back and is healthy and, and, and uh, Tatum and Brown can carry that team, then, then maybe the Celtics are the one. Um, but I feel like this is like a Miami, Milwaukee, um, and then we'll see in those three Western teams to, to get to the final four. Uh, you know, obviously it's either going to be Golden State or Memphis. We'll see how healthy the Warriors are. So I think that's what we're looking at. Well, the Memphis Grizzlies are at just over 13. You've got the Boston Celtics at 10. So Petering and obviously, well, people are keeping a bit of an eye on them as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the Mavericks, the Nuggets, all kind of similar odds, just over 10s, like I've said. So if you fancy a little bit of a punt on them, people who are listening, well, there you go. Pinnacle.com is where you can find it. Right. I know we've discussed it and we've kind of discussed this on every single podcast that we've done throughout this season. And um, well, there's, there's no real medal until obviously um, the, the end of the overall season but MVP quickly I mean I've asked you for names before but we've had more game time we've had more things to go on we're getting towards that business end you, I mean one of you has a vote I can't remember which one of you has a vote oh it's Joe who has a vote yeah and uh, <laughs> Seth doesn't but you, I remember you saying Seth if you did you probably wouldn't want one anyway or something I, I don't know I, anyway there we go but Seth if you um if you had to go for it now, I mean, you were nailing down Kevin Durant there, weren't you? I'm not going to, I'm not going to sway you, am I? Uh, no, if, if for MVP for this year, it's, 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 it's Jokic. Uh, Jokic one, Giannis okay. two, and B three. Um, and then kind of the, I feel like those are going to be the top three on the vast bulk of ballots uh, in some order. Um, and then four and five um, right now, I'd probably have Luca and Tatum, but it's, um, you know, uh, but those are sort of the, the nice to be in a conversation spots rather than, than players who are, or any sort of threat to actually take home the award. Okay. There we go. And Joe, obviously you've got a say in it. So, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a bit of a prisoner of the moment. I was in Brooklyn for Giannis, not only passing Kareem as the Bucks all the time leading scorer, but he went for like 44 and 14. And it was the second, it was his second game of that many points and that many rebounds in a row. Um, and then here in Cleveland, where I live, I was there on Sunday for, for Embiid's, um, 44 and 17, I think. And the rest of the Sixers were just garbage. Um, and he carried them. So, you know, like I watched these two guys going, wow, like how can they not be MVP? And then you just, uh, the, like I, you do any studying at all of, of Jokic and you watch the nuggets, which I have been in, seen them a number of times. Um, I, I just, I, he's, I'm going to vote for him. And then I don't know what I'm going to do at two and three. I will admit uh, in the last ESPN poll of writers, um, I was one of two people, I don't mind saying this, who had LeBron on the ballot. I had him as the last guy. I had him fifth. And the reason why I had him there is because he was eligible to be the, or to be the league's lead, uh, leader in scoring. And he was. Um, and I just thought it was insane. Uh, like if you take him off of the Lakers, they'd probably be winless. Um, the first team in history, 0 and 82. Uh, but I can't put him on my final ballot. He's hurt again. You have to be available. I don't even know if he's going to be eligible to be uh, the the scoring leader this year. And they're just so bad. They're not even going to make. They're not even going to make the play in. Um, he's not going to be on my final ballot. And I I don't know if it's uh, Luca and Ja. Is it Luca and DeRozan? What about Devin Booker? What about Jason Tatum? So I got some work to do on those final two slots. Well, there we have just, it. I, um, just, you know, the, the funny thing is, is, is people see, oh, like Giannis is making a push and beat is making a push. Let me read off Jokic's stats from the last month. Uh, so games since uh, he missed, he missed their game uh, on, on uh, March 4th. So the last 16 games, Nuggets have played. He's averaging 31.4 points, 13.3 rebounds, 8.1 assists, 1.7 steals, 1.4 blocks, shooting 63% from 63.5 from the floor and 82 from the line, despite not actually shooting well from three. Um, so, you know, 
for you, you can talk about the, the the performances that other other players are kind of stacking up here and there. That's been a month of play from Jokic, um, and that's just like that's just batty. And, <laughs> and I yeah, I just I I you know I've I've said enough. Yeah, well, there you go. There you go. Listers at home, I'm sure that as the season uh, continues, uh, you'll you'll see more ridiculous stuff from all of the players that we've mentioned, talked about in glow in terms in terms of the MB- MVP race. Uh, for the moment, though, on NBA breakdown, that is all uh, that we've actually got time for. So uh, to Joe Varden and to Seth Partner as well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for being with us, gentlemen, as ever. We'll probably do another podcast between now and the end of the season. All the odds are correct at the time of recording. You can check it out on pinnacle.com. There's loads of betting insight and education and resources as well. Betting resources uh, tab on the Pinnacle website. And we're on Twitter as well, at Pinnacle and pinnacle.betting on Instagram. So check those out too. More brilliant content and uh, yeah, happy basketball. Enjoy.